Welcome to Never Rewrite. I'm Isaac Askew. And I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And today we're going to be discussing the difference between what the customer wants and the customer's spec. Hmm. So the genesis of this episode, um, many years ago, like, gosh, 15 or more years ago at this point, I had a manager, uh, he was a good guy, and I always, I never delivered what he wanted. Okay. Every time we, every project, uh, he, we would sit down, we would talk about it, we, uh, and he would explain what the use case was and what it needed to do, and you know this, that, and the other thing, and I would build it, and then after it was done, we would talk about it, and he'd be like, oh, yes, I see, yes, this does everything that we discussed, and it, it solves the use case, so I guess we're going to use it, but I really wanted it built more like this. And then he would explain the difference between mm. what he wanted and what I built. I'm like, oh, yeah, I could see doing it that way. That would pretty much be the same. Like, it would be fine. You know, six of one, half dozen of the other, not right or wrong. Sure. And over time, we would get ever, we would just, so the next time that we had, the, so then the next project would come along and we would discuss more. We would, you know, we would discuss more, we would spec out more so that I would build the thing that he wanted. And it never happened. No, no matter how granular or complete <laughs> the specs that we were building amongst each other, I never built what he wanted. I built something that matched the spec. I built something that worked and solved the business case. So it was okay, but it was never what he wanted. And you know, we, it, as time went on, this went on for like almost a year. And this was a, I'm going to put out there that this was a positive case where my manager was a good guy. He, I don't think he was a particularly good manager. But he was, you know, he was not trying to screw me or, you know, gaslight me or anything like that. So this was not like a negative case where, right. you know, you've got somebody just out there to try to, to screw you up. Because I've, I've dealt with that. This is, both of us were positive intentioned people, but we couldn't agree on anything. Um, and eventually, like, I just got so frustrated, I transferred to another group in the company Ooh. so that I could get away from it. Because... It was not working. Like no matter, we would just talk more and more and more and more and more. And I would still not deliver the right thing. Was he just like a perfectionist? Was he expecting an exact thing? And like, he felt like he missed the mark? Because it seems kind of weird to be so picky if he's del if you're delivering exactly what he's asking for. But like, it, it maybe just doesn't have, maybe he has trouble like delegating and really letting somebody else get it done their way. Yes, that was the fundamental case of, because it didn't matter. Like mm -hmm. the difference between what I wrote and what he wanted didn't really matter. Yeah. Uh, in this case, he was a manager who was also expected to be writing code. So part of why mm -hmm. he cared was that his code had to interact with my code. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess uh, that helps. Um, But his code was fundamentally, not fundamentally, it was stylistically different. Um. Mm -hmm. But even when I tried to copy what he was thinking stylistically, I, I never, never got close. And there were a lot, there's a lot of lessons to, to be learned in that. Uh, just, just to start off, in retrospect, this is a very waterfall thing that we were doing. We would discuss, we would create a spec, and then I would build the thing. Mm -hmm. And then when I was done, we would go back and discuss, right? So we weren't iterating. I wasn't building a little bit, discussing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I see. And... and going back and you know in retrospect well, that was that was a mistake we weren't iterating and so the the customer was not happy because the final project was not what they wanted um but the other thing that it occurs to me it is the very the difference between what was in the spec like what we had agreed to and what they actually wanted um and this goes back to there's a whole body of literature uh, by Deming and other quality people. Uh, so we're going to talk, we're talking industrial factory stuff mm -hmm. about how no spec can ever be perfect enough that you can, like you can never write down a spec perfectly enough that you can then swap out and commoditize the labor. Um, so when it, when it comes to Deming, and these other things he's talking about like car companies mm -hmm. uh, where it's like oh well i need aluminum and if you've 
if you're working with one vendor and you've got this relationship that you build up over time, they know that this aluminum that you need is for making fenders. And because it's for fenders, they're going to ship you, you know, long rectangular pieces so that it's easier for you to sure. stamp them into fenders. Whereas if you just order a, you know, I need aluminum of this quality and I need this much from some random guy who can you know, deliver it cheaper, well, you might get cubes. And now you have to spend time reworking to cut your cubes into rectangles so that you can then stamp them into fenders. Got it. So with Deming and sort of the whole just in time, the Japanese philosophy of working with your vendors, the idea was if you're working with your vendors, you've got this positive reinforcement cycle going, even if somebody else could match the spec and do it cheaper, it wouldn't ever be worth it because of all the things that you didn't, that nobody knows to write into the spec, but your vendor, because you're working closely with them, they know, and they're doing for you. And so keeping the same vendors and keeping that same working processes together will reduce the amount of rework needed. Mm -hmm. uh, in the case of my manager, you know, my implementation might be fine and match all the spec. And then it, you know, we need to change, do some interface tweaking at the end so that my interface is aligned with what he was expecting, uh, like compositionally, like, oh, well, I, you know, you gave me 10 methods and I really wanted two. So I could just say, call the thing. I'm like, oh yeah, that's you know, easy enough to fix. I've got all the methods. I'll just make a super method that composes them the way you expect it. Mm -hmm. But it was rework. Right. And, you know, when you're talking quality, when you're talking speed, rework is the real killer. So was there a conversation at some point about, oh, we should be checking in more frequently so that you don't deliver him the, you know, the cube instead of the rectangle, so to speak? No, in retrospect, we should have, but I was much younger. And like I said, I did, I don't think he was a very good manager. Well, at the time, he wasn't a very good manager. It's been 15 years. He's probably gotten a lot better. <laughs> well, what about any other conversations where you're like, hey, uh, every single time I come to you, uh, you seem to say like the 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 specs are right, but every time I come back, they you have a you know a little bit of a revision or a complaint. Like there's never any like I'm frustrated uh, conversations with him other than you know you just booking it. No, no. So we talked. So that that's why every time we had a new project, the mm -hmm. the the spec cycle got bigger because we would talk more fully. We would talk through edge cases. We would talk through. Like the our we had the wrong solution. We kept going back to oh well, if only we communicated more up front, if only we were more waterfall, we would have right. fewer problems. And that never worked. There was no amount of let's build the spec up front that ever got us over our home. Uh, but we kept going back to it, uh, which I'll I'll put down as we were both much younger and earlier in our careers and thus not as good at these things. Got it. Um, I thought we were going to go for longer on this. I thought this was going to be a good <laughs> conversation. But here we are. We're like 10 minutes in and we're, we're drowning. Um, maybe this is a short episode. Yeah, uh, it could be. Um, we could also just pivot into conversations in general about... Um, <clears throat> managers that we're working with that uh, we do have problems with or we can't seem to kind of get on the same page um because i think like there's certain types of people that you can work with uh that make things easier for you and then certain types that you know make it harder mm. and we kind of touched on this back a couple episodes ago when we we're talking about like company culture and ego and things like that um so for example like um, delegation uh some managers are perfectionists and they they really are particular about uh the way code gets delivered mm -hmm. um because maybe like you were saying this this manager is doing a little bit of both uh they're managing and and uh coding and so when you're still in the game of coding so to speak you you have opinions you want things done the right way and if you're a perfectionist about it um you can spend infinite amount of time in code review getting things just right uh being nitpicky about it and then furthermore, if you're not very good at delegating and trusting people underneath you to get, you know, the job done, um, that can compound that. 
And I think on top of that, uh, also understanding the context of what you're building so you don't have to have, you know, the cube rectangle kind of conversation because you're like, you're already ahead of that. You know why you're building it too. So mm -hmm. you can kind of have that built-in context. Um, I think in general, uh, if if I explain why I'm building this, some, something to somebody to the point mm -hmm. where they know, oh, this is what I need to deliver. And it's not just spec. Some people will take a spec and just run with it. Oh, I have to build this thing. Okay, bye. And then they come back to you and it's like, okay, that technically works, but you know, uh, it, it's not going to be scalable or it's not going to solve this other problem. Remember, a customer is using it for X, Y, and Z. And they go, oh, I was just building it because these were the instructions, like a Lego manual, mm. not realizing how people are going to play with the Legos, that kind of thing. And I think that, that also can help bridge that gap. Yes, uh, I love that you said about some managers make it easy and some managers make it hard because mm -hmm. that is definitely a, a truism. Well, that's definitely been true in my experience. Like even whether there's positive intent or negative intent, uh, some managers just are very difficult to work with because they know what they want and they want you to build it. And some managers are very easy to work with because they know the outcome they want and they empower you to yeah. build it the way you need or whatever you want to build, however you want to build it, as long as you, they can get the outcome. Um, those managers are much better and they're much more effective because it's empowering. It's not, yeah. oh, build this thing exactly as I said. And then if anything, if there's any difference, then we have to go back and, and change it or fix it. Right. Whereas, you know, I, this is the result I want. And these are the, yeah. you know, bounds. Yeah. And I think, um, being able and this, this again goes back to previous conversations about like trust and trusting your manager mm -hmm. and making sure they're out to help you uh, and empower you if you go to your manager and you say you know or you have a conversation you're going to build this particular product and then you come back and you're checking in instead of doing the thing that you did where you just kind of like just you come back with a finished thing you check in a week later and then you say mm, actually i'm i'm struggling with this which you need to do if you are struggling. <laughs> like 50% of people I run into seem to just like, they want to spend as much time as possible trying to figure it out with no help. I don't know if it's like a thing where they just, they're obsessed with figuring out or just testing their own intellect. Oh, it's like there's people like, mm, there's a word on the tip of their tongue. And you're like, oh, let me Google it for you. You're like, no, 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 no. I have to figure it out. Don't, don't help me cheat. You're like, no, just... <laughs> you're wasting our it doesn't time matter yeah, yeah. <laughs> just look it up you know some people want to do that with code mm -hmm. uh, they don't want help they just mm, give, give me just a little bit i know i can figure it out myself it's fine but like <laughs> it's a team effort you let other people help you you know it's yeah. not like you just trying to figure out the the zelda puzzle by yourself that kind of thing um yes, it's, with with early career developers one thing i've learned to say often is when they probably don't get it like, okay, go spend half an hour on this and then I'm going to check in and we'll see where you are. And don't even give them the option of being like, if you have, you know, spend half an hour and if you have trouble, come back to me. Because yeah. a lot of them will still spend two, three hours and then come ask you questions. Like, I'm going to check in on you in 30 minutes and see how they're doing. Because if they're doing yeah. great, great. You just check in, they, they say, hey, 30 minutes, how you doing? Show me, great, moving along. So it gives you a great great way to be checking in and not being not being like oh well let me see i don't know if you can handle this <laughs> if you set up yeah. like i'm gonna check in 30 minutes whether you're doing great or not right yeah and then like from there maybe given a bit more space because i know like frequent check-ins can also be a bit burdensome can i interrupt you mm -hmm. um but then there's also the the opposite problem instead of the perfectionist uh manager that's not good at delegating and he's like really nitpicky uh, the other one is the aloof manager, right? <laughs> Who <laughs> knows they have a job to do and knows generally there are people on a team that they should do it, but they don't really know uh, effective ways to empower people. They're like, oh, you know, like, oh, you're having trouble with this. Uh, maybe just spend more time researching instead of, oh, well, talk to, you know, Jane Doe over here. She's actually ha has a ton of experience in that area. Let me connect you with her. Then you guys can work together on it. Or they just don't check in with you at all until yes. it's supposed to be delivered and you know three weeks in you've been struggling the entire time and they're expecting it to be done they're surprised that you're not done with it yet and they have zero context or just don't yeah the the, the, the folks who just don't even have one-on-ones or even touch base with you at all i've had many of them over the years uh 
where they're just like, they're like, hey, here's work. Yeah. I'll be back in a month <laughs> to pick it up. <laughs> it's, just like... it's just way too abstract. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's... And plus that, that feels almost disrespectful to me because like um, pretty much every, every good team I've been on has had a manager that checks in weekly. If the manager disappears or is constantly rescheduling one-on-ones to the point like, you know, maybe once a month you see them, generally speaking, uh, you're not going to be on the same page because you're going to lose track. And it's not even like a communication thing per se. It's just like every now and then when you're sailing a ship, you need that slight bit of course correction. You're generally going north or whatever, but uh, you're getting a little bit off and you need that check-in. And otherwise you're way off from that slight little change of direction. Um, yeah. Yes, I, I've had many managers over the years who just didn't ever. That's very, inter, well, not inter, like big, when you're at a big company, those are the kinds of things you have where you're just like, I remember I went six months and I didn't know who my manager was. Yep. <laughs> I got work from the PM and nobody else ever talked. Yeah. We, and again, like I was saying earlier, it feels like a, like, like with the rescheduling, the one-on-ones, it feels like a disrespect kind of thing. Cause it's like, you don't have time to guide me in my career. Uh, every, every, I mean, like your career is made up and composed of each, each of these weeks, you know, over time, mm -hmm. it's a big thing. So if you're not getting direction, you're not learning and you're not growing and someone's just like, go, go do this thing. Then later, if you build the wrong thing, or there's a huge miscommunication or you miss some Q3 thing and it's time for your review and they're like, oh, well, leadership is looking for us to, you know, for you to, for, to grow in these areas. We haven't seen you grow. And you're like, well, <laughs> there haven't been, you know, check-ins with me to, to make sure that I'm on the same path. You know, like it, mm -hmm. over time, it's going to impact you. So it still feels like a, a lack of respect. Yes, very much. Well, yeah, it's a, just a complete lack of interest in somebody's career. And yeah, yeah. Disrespect is a good way to put it. What, whether right, or not it's intentional. Yeah. Right, right. Whether or not it's, it's intentional disrespect, it's like passive, implicit <laughs> disrespect if you can't make time for somebody who's supposed to be reporting to you and needs advice in their career. Like, what what do you do? What are you managing? Right. <laughs> I, just... I had no idea from many managers that I've had. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah. project managers managing the project and you're like just in your office and approving vacation, I guess. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, coming back around, um, I'd say in this case too, I think I've also, it, in, in younger in my career, I would also be in the same boat where like someone would tell me what to do and I would probably just go and try to complete it. Mm -hmm. And the, and the check-ins wouldn't be more frequent. Later these days, like I, I'm actually going back and I'll, I'll drag feedback out of somebody. I'm like, uh, <clears throat> my current manager actually, is somebody who's like no news is good is good news, mm. uh, and, and that's fine. But that doesn't tell me very much about like my performance. Uh, I, I kind of like want to you know like I'm one of those people who wants to make sure I'm correcting that slide off course if I'm veering one way, and then you know I just want to I, I, I take pride in my job, so I, I want to make sure that you know I'm still delivering value and I haven't kind of slacked in one area when I was hyper focusing in another mm -hmm. area. And I know about my, I know that about myself too that. If somebody gives me a thing to work on, I like, zoom, like, you know, I, I, I zone out and like, just, well, well, like a zoom into it rather and try to just finish that thing. And then sometimes lose sight of the bigger picture. And I have to stop myself every now and then and be like, all right, there's other pieces, you know, let's, let's not just get super uh, obsessed about solving my little puzzle here. Let's communicate more. Yeah. So yeah, different management styles for sure. Um, and then as you, I think just as your career, progress as you go and look back and go oh that was the problem i had with that one manager oh they were just they weren't checking in enough with it, or i wasn't honest enough with them and just saying hey i'm struggling because i was scared that you know i would look bad that yeah. kind of thing yeah have you ever been in a situation uh and this i've spent many years at like big banks so I, this has happened to me a few times where you just feel entirely adrift like you've got these vague projects with no real delivery dates and you're just sort of working, but mostly not. Um, and you can be just adrift for months at a time where you're like, yeah, I got, you know, did 30 minutes of actual coding today. And yeah, most of it. I, I think I, 
I haven't had a particular, I can't point to a particular moment in time. I just know that a couple of companies ago, I had 10 managers across four years. Mm. And when you have managers swap that much, you do kind of feel adrift. Like you feel like your work is going to be at the whims of the next person who's coming in soon. And you, you almost feel like your work's meaningless. So like, I'll work on this. Oh, by the way, you know, your manager is going to be leaving the company. You have anyone coming in. And you're like, and you see it happen so frequently and your work change complete directions. So frequently mm-hmm. you're like, do I work on this thing? Will it actually be delivered? Because <laughs> If I deliver it, will it be used? Yeah. Is it actually useful or is this person who comes in to the company who just got onboarded real quick? Do they understand completely, you know, the context of what we're building and why do they have, they have enough information to tell me this is valuable to, to build uh, you can get confused in that way, so that, that I do feel like kind of like lost in those in those regards. If you, if you if you're changing teams or or your manager themselves are changing so frequently, where you can't have some kind of stable ground, um, uh, I felt that way. And, and also in the same sense, that is uh, you know, another form of, of disrespect because you're 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 essentially resetting your own career. Uh, path with each mm-hmm. person because no, none of them can vouch for who you are and what you've delivered right? yes <laughs> uh, i've definitely seen that uh where it's like well i'm new so i can't really give you a good positive review so yeah better luck next year yeah basically that happened to me <laughs> quite a few times i'm like okay look is there a like a director somewhere who i can just like report to them while like all of these managers are in flux because I want someone to understand that I'm still delivering valuable work, even if no one can go to bat for me during my annual review. Yeah. Have you had the flip where you deliver work and it never gets into production for whatever reason Um, that when I was at the large, you know, corporations, enterprisey stuff, it was fairly common that we would deliver work Mm -hmm. to spec and it would turn out not to be actually useful and so they just wouldn't release it or they'd release it, but it wouldn't make it, nobody would ever use it. Uh, and so would be six months worth of work and, you know, it had no impact at all to the company because nobody ever used it. Did you well, yes, on, on our shared experience for, for Nozomi, <laughs> I technically, but I think yes. some of the other stuff I was working on, I think um, uh, there was a lot of like test coverage work that got discarded. Hmm. Um uh, yeah, a lot of actually just like just deleted tests um, that really annoyed me at some point. I worked really hard on trying to, you know, keep things upgraded and I worked towards making sure we're staying on like major versions of stuff. But a lot of times I would just be like, eh, you're taking too long on that thing. We need you to, to work on this feature instead and just leave this thing in an old deprecated version until it becomes a bigger problem. Yeah. And those don't feel very good, but sometimes you can, like, I think in it, it I complain about them, but I think sometimes in retrospect, when I think mm-hmm. about other things that were happening at the company at the same time, I'm like, that was probably a decent decision to pull me off that. Cause like I said, I can get really obsessed with some things. And someone <laughs> says, you gotta, you gotta upgrade this. I'm like, all right. And I'll like, I'll have whiteboards out. I'm like, we gotta upgrade this thing. And the company climate could change and then go, Oh, the thing he's upgrading, actually, we're going to, we're moving from that technology anyway. And we have this other big problem. Maybe chat GPT comes out and we want to build mm-hmm. something with chat GPT. That's going to bring us way more value than the thing Isaac's obsessing about right now, uh, which was good at the time, but we need to pivot, that kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. Which is why if you deliver more iteratively, you could have locked in some of those gains. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Iterative uh, delivery for everything in your life, yeah. <laughs> including I, gains at the gym. <laughs> uh, well, gains at the gym are definitely iterative. You, you got to, yeah. You go and you definitely can't just deliver six months worth of workouts in one day. Yeah, well, and this is, you know, I guess we should wrap up sometime soon. Yeah. But the thing I was thinking of is like, for a while, I thought if I just got on the treadmill and just hit the ground running at like my max heart rate, that was good for me. And then later I found out <laughs> that's not helping nearly as much as like running at a comfortable pace for a longer period of time. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think. I think uh, conceptually, maybe this is a bad analogy, but a 10 minute sprint uh, is is the fast uh, thing that's not doing much for you. Whereas the slow delivery over time would be uh, maybe keeping um, the marathon concept 
of slowly, you know, helping your body build up your, your cardio, that kind of thing. But anyway, yes, <laughs> that's all I've got on uh, this topic. Yes. It was a rambly one. That's fine. Yeah. Um, thanks for listening. I'm Jeffrey Sherman. And I'm Isaac Askew. And this is Never Rewrite.